Good morning. Well, here we are again, a beautiful sunny Sunday, and we get to speak about God's Word again. For those of you who maybe are here for the first time or you're new, we're talking, we're in a series right now with something that's extremely useful, something the Bible has a lot to talk about, and also something that we use just about every day. Um, the Bible talks about finances and how to handle it and our attitude towards it and how to save it and how to invest it and how to give it um, over 2,000 times in your Bible. And it's something that we get to, to use all the time. And the, God was very concerned that you and I use it the right way and that we use it like a tool for good instead of letting it be like a ball and chain, which hinders us both spiritually and physically in this world. So I appreciate that about God. I appreciate the fact that God gave us practical wisdom that we can use in our lives. And uh, I'll just be very upfront with you. I've made a lot of mistakes in my life. I've made a lot of mistakes with money in my life. My parents were awesome parents. I had wonderful, godly parents. But they never really taught me about money. I never really understood money. Um, and I never had a mentor to really teach me. What I learned mostly about money, I learned from the Word of God. And it was an accumulation over time. Some things I picked up on very quickly and uh, did relatively well from the beginning. And other things I didn't really understand until my late 30s. And didn't even implement until um, later in life. And it's taken me a while to get a, a good balanced picture of what a, a successful Christian life is, handling money God's way. And um, I want you to know that I, I have something special for you. I have a gift I want to give every one of you. I made it up just for you. You won't find anything like it on the Internet. I made it for you. And as you leave today, the ushers will give you um, a handout that I made. And it has 15 wisdom principles from the Scriptures about how to handle money, and it'll help you a lot. I especially, um, I, I want to be able to bless every single person, but I have to admit, I have a soft spot in my heart for those of you who are young and have not yet gotten into the, some of the trouble that some of the older folks and, and some of us have gotten into. You can avoid those things. You don't have to learn everything the hard way, and uh, God wants to bless you. And he wants you to be a blessing to other people. So I have that for you. Don't leave this building without it. Um, you can get it at all. The exit's back there. The ushers will help you with that. Well, folks, we broke a record. Did you know that? We broke a record here in the United States. Yeah, well, don't clap yet. <laughs> I know you're enthusiastic. I love that. Guess what? We the people, not the government... We, the people, are now, I mean, we just broke the old record. We are now in 1 trillion, 200, or, two, or 23 billion dollars worth of just credit card debt. 1 trillion, 23 billion dollars, just credit card debt. Not home loans, not mortgages. Not school loans, not business loans, not car loans, not for your, a new boat or a, or a new quad, or just credit cards. Never been done before. Well, not those greedy pigs in Washington. No, we the people. We did it. Now, folks, there is something behind that kind of spending. There is a reason why people handle money the way they do. There's a reason that we do the things we do with money. It's called motive. It's the reason, it's the why behind the what. It's the why we did what we did. And motives are very important to God. Because motives are from the heart. Motives are like the roots of a tree. Motives are like the roots of a tree. They're hidden. You cannot see them because they're underground. And yet they're responsible for all the fruit that you do see. And our mo your motives are hidden to me. 
and mine might be hidden to you, but they are not hidden to God. In Proverbs chapter 4, 23, it says this. Proverbs 4, 23 says, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Everything you do flows from your heart. And that includes what you and I do with our money. Motives may be hidden to people, but not hidden to God. Proverbs 16, 2 says this. All a person's ways seem pure to them, but motives are weighed by the Lord. God knows why we're doing what we're doing. And motives are very important to God. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 1, Jesus said, Do not do your giving in front of other people to be seen by them. Because he says, if you do, you will receive no reward from your heavenly Father. What does that mean? That means God says, I'm looking at your motives. You see, giving's good, isn't it? It's good to give. Giving's a good thing. But we can do things that are even right and good, but have impure motives. Motives that are wrong. Motives are something you and I got to be careful of. Very careful. And we're going to look at some of them today. But I want to say this to you before I get started. We're going to look at eight reasons, eight motives behind the way people spend money. If you identify any one of these in your own life, it's very easy to fix. Go ahead and repent of it and confess it to God and receive mercy. If we see sin, you know, some people, they're very non-confrontational. They avoid confrontation. We can't be like that with ourselves. Let's do a self-assessment this morning. And let's go ahead and be honest with ourselves. If there are things in our, in our lives that are wrong, that are driving our spending, that we know are sinful and wrong, let's fix it. Let's just do what the Bible says. Let's be different from the world. We're, we're the children of God. And we live by a different standard and we belong to a different kingdom. And God is our Father, our Heavenly Father. I want to say this as well. I know that some of you are struggling financially. Some of you I, I really know because I know your stories. I know what some of you are going through right now. And I know some of you have hidden it very well and nobody knows. But I want you to know whatever situation you're in, I want you to know that God loves you. I want you to know that God sees what you're going through. Sometimes we as human beings, we will jump off the cliff and we'll pray for God to build us a parachute on the way down. And then when he doesn't, we get mad. We get mad at God. Let's not you and I be like that. Let's not go ahead and blame God for our mistakes. You see, sometimes I prayed and God has rescued me. And sometimes he let me hit the ground. I want you to know this. God will let you go through some things. He will. He will let you lose some things. He will. I got a call one night from a, an old friend of mine. And he said, Adam, he said, I'm at my very end. He said, I've been in the process of losing my home for about four years. He said, this is the home I bought with the inheritance I got from my father. And the bottom dropped out of the industry that I was a specialist in. And he said, it's just been one long process. We tried to keep ourselves alive with credit cards. Now I'm in debt for about $50,000 in credit cards. And he said, I'm going to lose my house. He said, it's put unbelievable strain on me. And he said, to be quite honest, I'm very depressed. And it feels like I want to kill myself. And him and I had a, a long talk that night. We talked to him. I talked to him about what was really important in life. And I said, brother, unless God does a miracle, you're going to lose some things. But I said, I want you to remember this. Whatever you do, don't lose your faith. If you lose your faith, that's it. But I said, if you keep your faith, God can restore everything that you're about to lose. See, Adam, where is he today? He owns a beautiful home, a much bigger, nicer one, on top of a mountain. He ended up buying the whole mountain. And he built all kinds of homes on it. 
He's much better off than he was. But let me tell you what happens when you get depressed. Depression many times is a spirit. Many times it is a murderous, suicidal spirit. And what Satan wants you to think is, my life will never be better than this. You stop being able to imagine ever being happy again. That's exactly where the enemy wants you. But if you'll keep your faith and say, God, if I were to lose everything and still have you, I'll be all right. If I lost everything and I still have you, I'll be all right. That's the attitude that'll pull you through. Faith that overcomes the world. So I want to give you that, I want to give you that encouragement. And I want you to know this. You got no judgment coming from me today. No condemnation. No, God, no condemnation, no judgment. I don't care what you've done wrong. I don't care if you've mishandled money. I don't care what the situation is. I got no judgment for you. I got no condemnation for you. I just want you to let the Holy Spirit comfort you and bless you today. And I want you to let him speak to your heart. And whatever he says, just do it. So let's go ahead and look at some things here. Let's examine our motives today. Let's examine our motives today. And let's go ahead and see where the Holy Spirit leads us. And if any of these is driving your spending, folks, let's correct it. Number one, greed. The number one thing I want us to look at is greed. What, what are our, what are our, look like here? See them all floating around? All these, these motives. I'm going to address all those things. These motives... They're the things that can wreck a life. They're the things that can draw us away from the Lord. But greed, number one, the insatiable desire for more. The worship of money and things. In Luke 12, 15, Jesus says, it says, Then he said to them, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. But you see, when you're driven by greed in the way you both make and spend money, you think it does. You think that is what life is. Life is the accumulation of possessions. And that greed drives your spending. It's your attitude towards everything. But Jesus said, life is not the accumulation of your possessions. That is not what life is. In fact, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. The Bible says those who live for pleasure are dead while they live. But Jesus says, if you have me, even though you die, yet shall you live. Jesus Christ is the life that you and I must have. He must dwell in us for us ever to have the life of God. Colossians 3.5 says, put to death, therefore. Colossians 3.5, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. The Word of God says that a greedy person might as well be down on their knees, bowing down to an idol. He said, it is worship. That money has become your God. Those things have become your God. And Jesus told us, we looked at this in the first week when I talked to you about the first principle. Jesus said, you cannot serve both God and money. You're going to have to pick a side. The second motivation we must avoid, we cannot allow to drive our spending, is pride. Pride says, look what I've got. Look what I can do. Look what I can afford. Even if you can't. Even if I have to go in debt. Even if I can't really, really afford it. You're sitting in that, that car at the showroom. You're sitting in the car you should never have sat in because the one you can afford is over there. But you're sitting in this one. And you're like, oh, the, the, how thick this steering wheel is. Real Corinthian leather. You're like, oh, oh, and the new car smell. It smells so good. And you're like, if they could just see me driving this down the road. Oh, if they could just see me now. Now, to make a... To make a purchase based on pride just to feed your ego is not wise. It is not wise. What does the Bible tell us? 
It says in 1 John 2, 16 and 17, For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father. That's not from God. It says, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away. But whoever does the will of God lives forever. Whoever does the will of God lives forever. Jesus, man, he just, he's always trying to tell us, folks, there's the stuff this world can offer, and then there's true everlasting wealth that I offer you. Do not let pride drive your spending. The third one I want us to look at is covetousness. Covetousness is when you're fantasizing about owning what somebody else has. By the way, I don't see anything wrong with being inspired at somebody else's lifestyle and saying, man, they, they handled money well. They worked hard. They're smart. I want to emulate their good habits. I'd like to end up where they are someday. That's not the same as coveting. Coveting is saying, I want what you've got. I want what you have. Now the question becomes, what are you willing to do to get it then? You know, people, I mean, not even a few, have killed other people to get what they've got. Have stolen to get what they've coveted that somebody else has. Have lied, have compromised their morals to get what somebody else has. What are you willing to do to get what you're coveting? To go into dangerous forms of debt, to doing things that are unwise with your money, to get what somebody else has that you want. The Bible tells us in Exodus chapter 20, verse 17, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. Now, you see an ox and a donkey to us, that's not very, that's not a big deal. But to them, it was like saying, and do not covet his tractor or his pickup truck. All right? Not his ox or his donkey, nothing. Don't covet. Why? Because if you let covetousness take root inside of your mind and get into your heart, it will always lead you to sin. Do not covet. Why should I covet what somebody else has? Why don't I just ask God for it myself? And if God says no, then God says no for a reason. Don't need to covet what somebody else has. Now, the fourth motive I want to look at today is very similar. It's very close to covetousness. Competition. There are people in this room that might think, well, I don't covet. But when I describe competition, you might be able to say, shoot, that's, that's something I do. Competition. I can't let them think they're more successful than I am. I can't let them think that they can do something I can't do. Competition. They're siblings that are in competition with one another. I've seen sisters in fierce competition with one another. I've seen brothers in fierce competition with one another. Now, by the way... I would never be dumb enough to try to compete with my brother financially. Uh, he's been smart with money ever since he was little. And um, he's always been good with money. And God has blessed him financially a lot. And he has a very successful company. And he's an extreme giver. My brother, Matthew, I, I love my brother. He gives away cars. He goes ahead and you know, he puts widows in their families in, a, in uh, some of the, his uh, rental properties. He, um, he's always giving to people that are in need. And God has blessed him richly. And every time God blesses him, he just keeps on letting it go. And, uh, but I'd never be dumb enough to compete with him. But sometimes people are competing with, I don't know, somebody from your graduating class, an old friend. I don't know who it is, but we try to compete with one another. Look at what the Bible says. It says in Galatians 6, 4, each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. 
When you're in competition, you're always comparing, always comparing, always competing. Willing to spend your money in a foolish manner to be able to keep up, to try and compare yourself with them. But here's the trap of comparing yourself with other people. Here's the trap. If you try to compare yourself with somebody who is more gifted than you in the financial arena, and by the way, folks, let's just face it. There are some people, God made them smart, and they will always have money. And they'll always have more than you. And that's okay. There's some people, they have a gift from God. They can literally lose a fortune and within a few years have it all back again. And there's other folks, you could literally drop a, a, a truck full of money on their front lawn and they'd be back in the same mess they are in in a few years because of the way they mishandle money. But if you compare yourself to somebody who's more gifted than you, then what's going to happen? This is the trap. Then you're going to think, I'm a failure. You feel inferior, feel like you're a loser. But then if you compare yourself to somebody who is less gifted than you, you're tempted to think you're superior. You're tempted to enter into pride and enter into that sin. God doesn't want us to compare ourselves with anybody. He says, you do the best you can do with what I gave you. That's what you have to answer for. I don't have to answer for what God gave Caleb. I don't have to answer for what God gave Dave Pagnini. I don't have to answer for what God gave anybody else. I got to answer for what God gave me. That's what I'm responsible for. And that's what he's going to judge me on. And that's the same thing for you. And by the way, um, we should always remember this. When you look at somebody else's life, when you look at somebody else's life, you're only seeing what they want you to see. You're seeing the bright and shiny life that they want you to see. What you're not seeing is very possibly the stress and the unhappiness that could be in that household. That's what you're not seeing. So it's foolish. Don't compare yourself to somebody else. Do the best that you can do. do use the gifts that God gave you and be thankful. The fifth thing I want us to look at is self-indulgence addicted to pleasure and unwilling to deprive yourself of anything. You want to find somebody who's destined to pretty much, you know, operate on a very low financial level most of their life? Somebody who's addicted to pleasure. Somebody who is living the self-indulgent life where they love pleasures more than they love God or anything else. James chapter 4 and verse 3 says this. Listen to how specific this is. Now, these are people that were praying for God to bless them financially. In James 4.3, it says, When you ask, you do not receive, because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You asked God, and God said no. And the reason he said no was because of all the selfishness in that prayer, you're not looking to bless a family. You're not looking to bless another person. You're not looking to have a balanced uh, view of money. It's so you can consume it on your own pleasures. There are people in our society that are unwilling to tell themselves no about anything. They will not deprive themselves because they believe some ridiculous commercial that said, you deserve it. How many million times do I have to hear that before I die? You deserve it. Why? What did I do to deserve your car? What did I do to deserve your milkshake? You know, I mean, what did I do that was so great? You don't even know me, but I deserve it. So come and pull out your wallet and spend it on our stuff. You deserve it. Well, folks, especially those of you who are just starting out, let me tell you a secret. Now, this might be one of the hardest things to do, but discipline and self-control when it comes to money is going to go an awful long way in your life. I heard the testimony of a gentleman recently who gave up smoking so he could buy a truck. He calculated and he loved smoking. It was a pleasure for him. He looked at how much he was spending on the cigarettes that he was smoking every day. And he calculated that by 365 days, and then he divided it by 12. And he says, you know what? I could make a very substantial payment on a truck. 
And he went out and he bought one. He didn't make any more money than he was already making. Didn't have to go out and get a second job. He deprived himself of a pleasure. You see, before, all he was buying was a giant cloud of smoke. A cloud. That's what he got for his money. And then he's driving around in a new truck. That's a pretty good switch, don't you think? All because he was willing to deprive himself of something. There are some folks, if you just got up a little bit earlier and made your own coffee, instead of swinging by Starbucks or swinging by Dunkin' Donuts a couple times a day, and you calculated what you could save, at the end of the year, you'd look and you'd say, wow, $1,000 in my bank account? I've never had that much before. Well, it came through something very simple called discipline and depriving yourself of something that you want. But when you will not do that, I want it, I'm going to get it. I don't have the money, I'll borrow it. Maybe I'll steal it. When you're unwilling to deprive yourself of the smallest pleasures, you are living for pleasure. And the Bible says those that live for pleasure are dead, yet while they live. You and I must not be driven by pleasure in this life for how we spend our money. Proverbs 21, 17 says this. Proverbs 21, 17 says, Whoever loves pleasure will become poor. Whoever loves wine and olive oil will never be rich. Now, by the way, that was party food. For you and I, we don't think much of that. But back then, a lot of times bread was simply served with salt in ancient times. If you had some money, you could serve your guests bread with a bowl of olive oil with different seasonings in it. Like you ever go to Bertucci's and you go there and they put that little dish in front of you? What time is it? All right, never mind. Uh, and you, you go there and you dip that bread and that olive oil and you eat it. You're like, wow, I, I don't even need my meal now. I've, I've eaten so much of this. It's so good. Well, back then it was a bit of a luxury. The wine and the olive oil, it was all about partying. It was all about the luxuriant living. It was all about excess. And he's saying, if that's what's driving your spending, you will never be rich. You will never have what you uh, will hope. He said, you'll be poor. The sixth motivation for spending our money and how we address money is insecurity. We must avoid these wrong motives. We must not let them drive our spending. Insecurity. Insecurity. I need that so I can feel important. I need to buy that. I need to own that. I need to wear that so I can feel valuable. So I can feel like I'm worth something. Maybe then they'll accept me. Maybe then They'll like me. How many billions of dollars a year are spent on that? In Romans 5, verses 7 and 8, it says, Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Though for a good person, somebody might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I hope that's enough for you. Because there's nothing else that's coming that can top it. You and I must find our worth and our value in what Jesus did for us. That's how much you're worth. And that has to be enough. And when you see that thing and you're tempted to buy it so that you can get that feeling, people spending so much money trying to achieve a feeling that could all be theirs if they would just believe their Bible. The Bible says, he who spared not his own son, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? God did not spare his own son when it came to you. 
that should be enough. That's where your worth, that's where your value comes from. Not by spending money hand over fist on things that can never achieve that feeling truly. The seventh motive for spending that we must never allow to be our motives is fear. Fear is a big motive for a lot of people in a lot of areas in their life. Fear, of course, we know leads to hoarding. It leads to stinginess. Now, remember, we talked about last week about how we are not under the law any longer. But the Bible says we've been released from the law so that we can serve in the new way of the Spirit. God wants to lead us in every area of our life, including our finances. And I want to make this statement in case I didn't make it last week. The Holy Spirit will lead his people to generosity 100% of the time. Do Do you understand that? Because the Holy Spirit is God. And God is generous. And God will always lead you and I toward generosity 100% of the time. But people who are afraid, I know some folks, they were so afraid of losing money in the stock market, they never invested. And now they're approaching retirement and they've got nothing. Afraid, so hesitant, so hesitant to invest for the fear of loss. Not willing to risk anything. By the way, I've heard this a number of different times. They said the number one thing that men say they regret when they retire is they didn't take enough risks, that they played it too safe. We don't want to take stupid risks. We don't want to do dumb things. But there are certain things that are worth a risk. And you don't have to take risks that are that risky. I mean, there's a smart way to do everything. But because of their fear, they didn't use the wisdom to plan ahead. And now they're going to be a burden on somebody. There's other people, they're afraid to give because they're afraid of loss. They're afraid of doing without. Look at me what it says over in Proverbs chapter 11, verses 24 and 25. It says, one person gives freely. Yet they gain even more. Another withholds unduly, but they come to poverty. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. He says there's one person, they're, they're free, they're generous. They, they, give, they give openly and they give freely. And yet they gain even more. God blesses their life. But says then there's others... They withhold, and it says unduly. And that means there was really no good reason for it. You were there, and you had it, and you kind of wanted to, but you had that hesitation, that thing that, that got stuck. And then later on, you thought to yourself, why did I do that? I could have easily done that. I could have helped that person. Why did I, I sit there and watch somebody else step in and do what I should have done? Fear. A lack of trust in God. Fear of loss. Not believing that God's promises are true. When God says, if you help somebody else, when it's your turn, I'll send people to come help you. Do not let fear drive your spending or your attitude or the way you handle money. Because it's wrong. God's people are not a scared people. God's people are a brave people. And they're full of faith. And you are God's people. All right? You're God's people. That's you. The last one I want you to look at is discontentment. Discontentment. There is no amount of money or things you will ever accumulate that will get rid of that. Discontentment is not an external problem, and it cannot be solved with external solutions. Discontentment comes right out of your and my heart. Discontentment, unthankfulness, dissatisfaction with everything. I'm bored. Sick of this house. Yeah, it's okay. Let's let's get let's move. Let's get a bigger one. Let's change our zip code. That'll fix all my problems. Let's move. This car, it's all right. Yeah, it runs fine. 
I'm just content. Let's get a, let's get a more expensive one, a faster one. This church, I'm sick of this church. We've come here long enough. Let's get out of here. Let's go try another one. Oh, discontented. This husband, this wife. Oh, I'm discontented. Maybe I'll trade up for a younger model. <laughs> We're all laughing, but we also know it's true, don't we? Discontented. Unthankful, always looking over the fence, discontent with what I've got. Discontentment will chase you your whole life. You will never be able to fill that hole up. It will always be empty. You can get everything you want. Go ahead and get your new house and your new car and trade up and get your new husband and get your new wife and leave your church and then quit your job and go get another job and be just as empty and dissatisfied as before. Because discontentment is a condition of your heart. It means you're unthankful for what God's already given you and you are far from God. I'm not putting anybody down, but I'm telling you, that's the truth. You're far from God because when you're close to God, everything comes back into perspective. Everything comes into focus and you realize how good you've really got it. You've heard me say this many times. There are people who, if they could have your life for just one day, they would think they won the lottery. People who are living throughout this world in so much poverty, if they could just be you for one day, they would think they're dreaming. Discontentment is a horrible sin. And you and I got to be aware of that one because it can sneak up on any one of us. I'm bored. That's not a good reason to ruin your life and the life of other people around you. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verse 6 says this, Better is one handful with tranquility, peace, than to have two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. You see, discontentment is like somebody trying to chase after the wind. Can I ask you all a question? If you're chasing after the wind, will you ever catch it? Never. I don't care if you're the fastest runner in the world, you will never catch the wind. How will you know when you've caught it? You don't. You just never do. You never will. He says, better to have one handful. Better to have one handful and you just say, thank you, God, than to have two and to have all kinds of contention in your life. Learn to be thankful for what you've got. Learn to be content with what God has given you. If God wants to bless you with more, so be it. But do not chase, like Jesus said. Jesus said, the pagans run after all that stuff. That's what the pagans, the unbelievers are running after. He says, not you. You. You seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all these things shall be added to you as well. That is the only principle I know of in Scripture that will take care of everything. It's the master principle. It's the first principle. If you take care of that, everything else falls into order. That's why I taught it to you first. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, money's a test for all of us, isn't it? It's a test for us every day because we use it every day. We have to constantly make sure that our heart is right. We have to constantly make sure that our motives are right. It tests who we love. It tests who we're really serving. It tests who we're really trusting in, where we really find our worth, and what we really believe. Do you believe the words of Jesus, or do you believe the commercials? That's right, Jesus. You see, we think we can separate our finances from our relationship with God. But you can't. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also, didn't he? He says they're connected. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. They're connected. One of the most beautiful stories in scripture, I just love this because of what Jesus said that illustrates what I just talked about. 
is where Jesus is in the home of a tax collector named Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, it says, was a short man. He wasn't very big and he couldn't see over the crowd. So it says he climbed a tree. It says it was a sycamore tree. And when he got up there, he's looking at Jesus. He's just fascinated with Jesus. He wants to see Jesus. Now you gotta understand tax collectors in their day were traitors. They were considered to be traitors to Israel because they were working on behalf of Rome, their arch enemies. And they would go on the behalf of Rome and collect money for taxes from their own people. And they actually had to overcharge them if they wanted to make anything. So they cheated their own people in order to get rich, to collect taxes for their enemies. He was hated. He's up in this tree. He just has to see Jesus. Who is this person? And as Jesus walks by the tree, the Bible says Jesus looked up at Zacchaeus and he said, Zacchaeus, I need you to come down here. I'm going to your house today. He must have been so surprised and thrilled. But it says all the people around there were disgusted. How could Jesus go to the house of a sinner? Like, like we're not sinners. Like we're not sinners. He is. But they, they didn't understand it. But when Jesus got in there and he's sitting at table with Zacchaeus and they're talking about the kingdom of God and Jesus is no doubt sharing the good news with him, the Bible says that Zacchaeus did something wonderful. In Luke chapter 19, verses 8 through 10, it says, But Zacchaeus stood up and he said to the Lord, Lord, look, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I'll pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house. Because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Did you see what Jesus said? Salvation has come to this house and to this man because of what he is now willing to do with his money. Do you not find that interesting? You see, we think we can separate it, but nobody like Jesus showed us that our relationship with God and our finances are connected. God wants us to be able to flow in the blessed life that he's provided so that we don't have to worry about money like the world does and be obsessed with it like the world is. He wants to bless us and he wants to use us to be a blessing to help others all around us. That's God's plan, his financial plan for his people. I just love the fact that Jesus said salvation has come to this house because I came here to seek out and to save people that are lost. Ladies and gentlemen, you and I both know Jesus did not die on the cross so that we could get big offerings. That's not what he was after. He was after something far more expensive. He's after you and he's after me. He wants us. He wants our heart. He wants our motives to be pure. And the only reason we talked about money today is because that's our subject. You guys know how we could, have, we could have applied this to many areas of life, couldn't we? Many areas. But Jesus Christ came to this planet to seek out and to save people that are lost. You say, Adam, how do I know if I'm lost? What does that term mean? It means you're lost spiritually. It means you're supposed to be home with your father. You're supposed to be home with God. He wants you with him always for eternity. Do you remember the parable of the prodigal son? Do you remember when his son went off and, and entered into a, a sinful, rebellious life, but then came back again? His father said, this is my son who was lost. But now he's found because he's back with me now. He said he was dead, but now he's alive. You see, when we are not a part of God's family, we're spiritually dead. We need the life of God, the life of God in us through the precious Holy Spirit. I would be wrong not to offer you the chance to join God's family, to be a receiver of this kindness, of this gift 
that God offers the whole world. You see, when you come to church, it's a very special place. You get to hear things both practical and spiritual, and you get to receive something you won't receive anywhere else, an opportunity, a chance to fix things, to make things right. If you're here this morning and you say, Adam, I want to receive God's gift of eternal life. I don't want to be lost. I want to be found. I, want, I don't want to be dead spiritually. I want to be alive. I want God to make me alive by his power. I want to know the Holy Spirit lives in me and will never leave me, will be with me always. I want to receive the gift of eternal life to know that I'm forgiven of my sins and to know that I never have to doubt it again. If there's anybody here today, you're saying, Adam, I know you talked about money, but I feel like the Holy Spirit is talking to me about eternity. I feel like the Holy Spirit's been talking to me about eternity for a long time. You say, Adam, I want to fix that today. Let's fix it right now. Let's fix it. Let's take care of it right now. You say, Adam, that's me. I want to do it today. I want you to be really bold. I just want you to put your hand up. So I, be very bold. Put your hand right up. Don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid of anything. If you say, I want to fix that this morning. I just want to take care of that between me and God. Is there anybody here today? Anybody at all? All right. Praise God. Very good. Very good. Is there anybody else? Because I bet there is. If you raise your hand, and I did get to see who raised your hand, I want you to come here right now. I want you to get up, and if somebody's sitting next to you that'll come with you, let them come with you. I want you to come here right now, and I want you to stand right here, and we're going to pray together. I want to pray with you right now, and let's go ahead and receive God's gift of eternal life. right now. Look how brave. You know what's funny is how brave the women are? How brave the women usually are? Guys, I'm appealing to you. Man to man. Man to man. Do the right thing. If the Lord's been speaking to you and you say, I want to fix it. I want to get my relationship with God right. Maybe you're here today and you say, Adam, I'm a bit like the prodigal son. I do know the Lord. I do know God. But I feel very far away and I have for a while. I'd like to be prayed for, I'd like to fix that. If that's you, I want you to come. This is your gold-plated invitation, okay? I want you to come. How about you open the balcony? You're not too far away. Anybody else? Praise God. Um, all right. Is anybody down here to receive God's gift of salvation, or is it for something else? Is it for something different? Something else. All right. Amen. All right. Peter, my brother, good brother. All right, let's all pray together. Let's pray together the salvation prayer, and I'm going to also include in it something for the rest of you, okay? Let's pray together, and let's, let's believe with all of our heart. I want you to know something. God loves you. God loves you. God's not condemning you. He's not mad at you. He really just wants to bless us. He really wants to help us to see what it's really all about. He always has. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for my salvation. Thank you so much for Jesus Christ. I believe in Jesus. 
I believe in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. I believe it was done for me. I receive that gift. Thank you, Lord God. Please forgive me of all my sins. I confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. That means I'm going to do what he says from now on. I'm going to read my Bible. And I'm going to do what it says. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, I pray for those who are here right now who heard your call in their heart and they obeyed. I thank you, Lord God, that they came in response to your word. I ask in Jesus' name that you would help them both spiritually and financially. I pray for a blessing upon them. I pray that you would show them things that they've not been able to see, that you would illuminate their mind. I pray that you would open doors for them that were formerly closed and that you would show them the way. I pray that you would be generous, Lord God, and merciful to them. I thank you, Lord God, for your goodness. I pray that you'd pour your bounty out on them and show them, Lord God, how to really understand what true riches really are in this world. You said, Lord God, that if we would draw near to you, you would draw near to us. And that's exactly what you have done. I thank you for your power and your Holy Spirit and your word. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless all of you. Hey, folks, I got a question for you. When's the best time to plant a tree? 20 years ago. That's right. The best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. When's the second best time? Right now, today. You might be saying to yourselves, oh, Adam, if I'd had this 20 years ago, if only I'd started 20 years ago. Well, you know what? We can't go back in time. We can't fix that. But today is whatever you want it to be. All right? God bless you.